people who need the care at the end of life and looking at improving that care. I also must say that the session is being recorded today, so if you have any objections to being recorded, let me know, but it's being recorded and will be available after today. If I may, though, I want to start with talking about um, some soon to be published work that um, Homeless Link is involved with, Homeless Link Legacies of Work, as part of the Health and Wellbeing Alliance. The Health and Wellbeing Alliance is from 21 organisations, all from the voluntary sector, and working together with Public Health England, Public Health England, and um, uh, Department of Health and Social Care, working towards bringing the voluntary sector closer to health, and working together for solutions on a whole range of issues, including homelessness, and end of life care. So this piece of work um, is called Care Committed to Me and was led by Hospice UK in collaboration with Homeless Link, my organisation, the LGBT Foundation, Together for Short Lives, Marie Curie and um, Friends, Families and Travellers. Care Committed to Me is a resource that will set out the work in progress to improve post-centred care at end of life for gypsies and travellers, LGBT people, people who are homeless and young people. The work consisted of a literature review, focus groups, stakeholder engagement consultation, and the publication will really set out the ways in which the commitment of the government towards inequalities in end of life care can be achieved. So in order to achieve end of life care, and this has to be a good way for people who are in these four groups, um, including young people, can be done by looking at five key principles. So good communication is really key here. So recognising and responding to varying literacy levels and helping people to make informed decisions about their care and their life. Taking an approach founded on dignity and respect for all provision of workforce training and support. I mentioned earlier about hospital staff, so being sure that those who are working with people in any setting are enabled and supported around them in the right care. Enabling and investing in relationships of trust an individual and partnership level, recognising that all people are different and care needs to be inclusive and equitable. So when the report comes out, which will hopefully be in a couple of weeks' time, we'll share that with you and do share that with your colleagues. It's a very important piece of work. We're very keen to have it out there and to be able to make some change at this level. So now on to our session. Um, my pleasure to introduce Caroline Shulman. Dr. Caroline Shulman is GP. He's been homeless and inclusion health for over 10 years. He's a specialist homeless general practice as well as in um, halfway hospital teams at King's College Hospital in London. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. So, um, so as Caroline said, I'm a clinician. Uh, I've been working with homeless people, but I've also had the privilege of um, leading on a piece of research looking at palliative care and homelessness, and I'm going to be uh, talking by, uh, about that as well. Today. Um, so I'm going to be talking first, and then Neve Brophy is going to be talking um, with, with following on from me. But what I'm going to talk about initially is a little bit about homelessness and, and the background of homelessness and some of the, um, the health impact of homelessness, and then around um, the research and findings from that research, but then also moving forward and how we can all work together really to improve the situation. So when we're talking about homelessness, we're not only talking about people who are sleeping on the street. That's the very visible, harsh end of homelessness and obviously highly important and has to be addressed. But there's also thousands of people, you can't hear me, sorry, can you hear me now? I'm a bit small, let me just move that down. I'm a little bit vertically challenged, but thank you for <laughs> How's that? Better? Perfect. And do wave again if I move. I'm a bit mobile. Um, so, um, homelessness, so not just people who are rough sleeping, but also um, people who are living in temporary accommodation, such as hostels, which is not a permanent home, uh, squatting, sofa surfing, um, or living in temporary accommodation, which can often be bed and breakfast. And I don't think anyone would be surprised <coughs> to see this slide of homelessness is increasing. I think everyone in the country seems to be aware of this, seeing many more homeless people on the street. And homelessness has doubled um, in every format since 2010. 
uh, homeless hospital places have actually reduced while homelessness has increased. And there's thousands of people, including families with children, in temporary accommodation. There's a huge hidden homeless population as well, so people who are sleeping on friends' sofas and floors. And I'm just going to really talk briefly about the really huge issue of what are the causes of homelessness. So we can think about homelessness as being um, caused by a lot of structural changes, so things around austerity has increased homelessness, um, housing benefit changes, um, and housing stock, lack of places for people to actually live. So there's huge, there's policies impact on, on reasons for homelessness. But there's also many other individual factors as well. So a lot of people that we find who are single homeless uh, people with very complex needs have a very high proportion of them have had serious adverse childhood events, which means they've often spent life in and out of care institutions. Um, they often had a parent, for example, who has addiction issues or experienced domestic violence, um, and often end up then in this cycle of homelessness and, uh, and often in and out of the criminal justice system as well. So there are so there are many different reasons. Other people find themselves homeless because their marriage breaks down and, 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 they, and, they, and they can't or they can't pay their mortgage. But there's also this hardcore group which have very, very multiple complex needs who end up very marginalised in our society. Mental health issues are often a cause and an effect of homelessness, as are drug and alcohol issues. So I'm just going to have a little digression about a few, there's a few little things which I think will be quite useful for the group to just, just to be up, up to speed on. Um, so one is, there's been a new Homelessness Reduction Act, which some of you, um, or all of you may be aware of, which came into force in April 2018. And this put a further duty on local authorities to address homelessness, to try and assess and prevent um, and uh, deal with people who were threatened with homelessness um, or were homeless themselves. Um, so there is a legal duty now for people to be provided with meaningful assistance to prevent and alleviate homelessness. But this relief duty lasts for around 56 days, during which time a local authority should be supporting someone into maybe the private rental sector. It's not a panacea, it's, some, it's a step towards help, um, but again it's often not there really for people with the most complex needs. Um, the other thing to raise for anyone working in hospitals is there is a duty to refer anybody who believed to be um, homeless or threatened with homelessness who consents to refer to a local authority. Another huge elephant in the room, I'm just going to um, talk very briefly about people with no recourse to public funds, because the Homelessness Reduction Act um, only is there for people who are eligible for benefits. So anybody who is not eligible or entitled to um, uh, support from a local authority um, is not helped at all. And there is a growing number of people who have no recourse to public funds. So I think probably, um, I don't know if many of you have had, uh, have had a problem with trying to work out what to do with somebody who has no recourse to public funds. And it is really, really difficult. But I will put this up there. That it is social services have a duty still to do a needs assessment for somebody who is an adult in need. Um, and um, so they if somebody some people um, are entitled under the CARE Act, some people are not, in which case they have a duty to do a human rights assessment, and they will sometimes provide accommodation. So this is something that in my in my other job, working within a hospital homelessness team, we spend a lot of time negotiating and trying to push social services to provide care and support for people who, who are very, very sick and who have no recourse to public funds. Obviously, people who are from the EU, um, there, are, there are many charities and other charities that help to re, uh, reconnect people back with their home country, but many people do not want to return. So the situation is even worse. Um, there's a really useful uh, network, the No Recourse to Public Funds network, which I could link to as well if anyone wants further information. And the other elephant in the room, the growing problem of NHS charging. Um, 
So um, people who are not eligible, um, some people are chargeable. So if you're EU, you are not chargeable still. Um, <laughs> well, we'll see what happens by April next year. Um, and uh, obviously, but if you're an undocumented migrant or you're here, um, you're, you're, you've, uh, you're a failed asylum seeker, you are potentially chargeable for NHS care. Now, again, um, hospice care is exempt at the moment because it's partially charitably funded. So the government decided that actually it would be quite tricky to decide how much they should be clawing back uh, from hospice. So hospices are okay at the moment, but obviously you have your own financial constraints, so it's not easy. Um, but the other thing that I just wanted to put up here, which is why I put this slide in, is that urgent and necessary treatment should never be withheld, even if somebody is chargeable. It's a clinician's decision whether that treatment should still be given. And I reinforce that is not a manager's, it's not an overseas manager's decision as to whether or not to withhold treatment for somebody who is unable to pay up front. It doesn't mean that they're not chargeable, but hey, you know, they're destitute how they're going to pay. Um, so now moving on really back to the main um, bit of the presentation, so around um, health and uh, homelessness. So people who are homeless often have very, very multiple and complex needs. So we often describe this trimorbidity, which is a combination of mental health difficulties, substance misuse um, issues, as well as profound physical health problems. So we've got a very, very unwell population, and they have many, many barriers to accessing care. So um, down to the restriction of um, having, if you have a chaotic lifestyle, it's very, very difficult often to make appointments and then you get uh, discharged from services very easily now, um, including even drug and alcohol services, I have to say, which uh, often are, are not any more flexible than other services. Um, and also health is often not a priority, so people often seek treatment um, when their problems have reached a very advanced stage. And this is again for another uh, a number of reasons. So we often have people who are attending A and E often collapse by the time they get to A and E. Um, and we we know that, um, and certainly from our, our research and from speaking to people, we know that people really don't want to go to A and E um, or be admitted if they have uh, addiction issues. Um, it's 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 very very hard for people to wait in A and E. It's not seen as a priority if they're withdrawing, so they will disappear. Um, and uh, they get what they really need. Um, so one of the other major problems that I've seen time and again is actually people having very serious conditions being missed in a &E. So you might have somebody who comes to a &E, um, who I've seen people with things like spinal abscesses um, who've been to five different a &Es before it's diagnosed because they're, oh, they're a drug addict, addicted to opiates, they must be here for treatment seeking, uh, and uh, if anyone actually did you know, the basic blood test and found them, they'd see that actually there was more going on. So people who are IV drug users are very high risk of very serious infections, and, and it's, it's everyone needs to be very vigilant. So I do quite a lot of teaching within the acute hospital setting uh, to a &E doctors and others, really to be highly alert for somebody who is an injecting drug user for the unusual presentations of infections that are actually very common. Um, so people often feel very alienated with the mainstream setting. It's often very difficult for people working within mainstream settings um, to accommodate people who have uh, potentially difficult behaviours um, or have addiction issues. So it's a, it's a two-way complexity. Um, and that results in a high rate of self-discharge from hospital, and also um, unsafe discharge from hospital. So people, you know, some people addicted, some people get addicted from hospital and they're still very unwell. Or their discharge destination is not being taken into account by acute, acute trusts. So I'm in no way criticising acute hospitals because there is huge, everyone is under huge pressure, and I see it from both sides by my work within the acute trusts. But I feel very privileged to actually be able to work within an acute hospital setting and do what I can to try and ease some of these problems and prevent unsafe discharges. 
So all of this combined, really, uh, results in these staggering figures, which are still there and have been very similar for many years. And the homeless people are dying incredibly young. They're dying an uh, average age of death in the UK for a homeless woman is around 23 and a homeless man around 27. And this is mainly people who have a history of rough sleeping with single homeless people. And um, there's been, a, in December last year, um, a, an article in The Lancet which looked at all industrialised countries, actually, and pulled uh, marginalised groups, so that's uh, homeless people and uh, people with uh, substance misuse issues and people sex working, and they found that they are 8 to 12 times higher, are more likely to die. Their standardised mortality rates are 8 to 12 times greater than the rest of the population. Now, to put that into... Sorry. To put that into... To put my blow in No, that's all. Um, to put that into context, um, the, uh, the people with multiple deprivation scores of five, so, so very high multiple deprivation scores um, compared with the rest of the population, so that's people from the most deprived sectors of our community, other than this group, um, have two to three times the risk of a, a standardised mortality rate. So we're talking a, a huge amount of more than that. <clears throat> And what are they dying from? So this is thanks to me from St Mungo's, this slide. Um, this is around causes of death uh, from people in St Mungo's hospitals. And um, as you can see from this, about half of the deaths are from organ failure, which the majority are from uh, liver disease. Um, so that slide is up there really just to show that there is the, the complexity of deaths. It's a very different pattern of uh, deaths from the rest of the So we know that dying as a homeless person, uh, deaths are often sudden, untimely, undignified, with access to palliative care being very unusual. So the question is how do we improve the palliative care of homeless people? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Gemma. So Gemma, um, I met Gemma only briefly actually a couple of times. Gemma was 28. She'd been living on the street for many years. Um, she had uh, she was addicted to um, heroin and um, also alcohol. She had hepatitis C and she had decompensated liver disease. So when I met her, she had had I think about six previous hospital admissions at different hospitals in the previous year, and she came in encephalopathic. Um, but within 24, 48 hours, she was a lot better. Uh, she ended up self-discharging. I went off to try and get her a TB card and her slightly coercive uh, partner came and removed her from the hospital before she completed her treatment. So we had emergency community meetings because she still um, had bacteremia and she still needed intravenous antibiotics. Um, got her back in, she came back in for a few days and then left. Um, and uh, then I found that she had she, she got her into a hostel with her partner um, and then found that about a month later she collapsed at a weekend and died. Um, so I suppose the question is, what more could we have done? How could we improve palliative care for somebody such as Jenna, who had a very painful lifestyle, hated being in the hospital, self-discharged, and know who really felt that they needed a way out? So, that sort of was part of the reason um, for our research. So what we've done, and apologies to those, I know that some people in the audience have already um, heard um, some of this, but so we, we interviewed uh, about 127 people, um, and uh, they were people who were living within hostels or attending day centres, people who had moved on and were working, um, they, had ex they were experts by experience, working in homelessness um, to support others, um, and a range of uh, hostel staff and managers and day centre staff and managers and outreach staff, as well as a range of healthcare providers and professionals, including people working in palliative care settings and um, also addiction psychiatrists and nurses and GPs. And our findings were, well, this is all very complicated. 
So that's why I'm going to try and break that down and also draw from it some of our recommendations and what we feel can really help and the next stage of where we go um, before handing over to me, who's got some very, we, we can go into a lot of those that we want to Complicated why? Well, I think that people are just resistant to the concept. So is this microphone working all right? It's making some weird noise. <coughs> Um, I think that people are just resistant to the concept of homeless people being palliative patients. You're dealing with people who are still relatively young. It's difficult. So you think of Gemma, 28 years old. You wouldn't really normally think of somebody of 28 with a whole life ahead of her as being palliative. So one of the key areas is obviously there's a huge amount of uncertainty and complexity. Um, so people, for example, with advanced liver disease or organ failure often have these periods of admission to hospital where they're very, very sick. Each of those admissions could be their last, or, but they often sort of bounce back up to probably not to where they were prior to admission, but they bounce back up. And that can go on and on for a number of years. Often we know that the more frequent those admissions are, the more likely that person is to die. But it's very difficult to predict how long somebody may live for. Um, and how many times have people been told, oh well, you know, if you carry on, you know, carry on drinking, you'll be dead within six months. Well, you know, we know that many people actually that doesn't happen to, and then that 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 comment doesn't really help them uh, address their drinking. But we do know that we've got the complexity of organ failure, but in addition, where you've got substance misuse chaotic lifestyle potentially and not wanting to access healthcare, you've got many other complexities added into that mix. So deaths are often sudden, but you wouldn't say they're necessarily unexpected. So an in-reach nurse uh, working in a hospital said, I think everyone knew she was very, very sick, but I sort of have an informal list of people that this isn't good news, but actually then a third of them probably move up to my this is really bad news. But how do you know how to so that's one of the huge challenges, is this uncertainty. Another of the huge challenges is there's huge lack of options as well. So many people with very complex needs, as Caroline mentioned in her introduction, um, who are people who are at risk of dying, end up dying within hostels and within temporary accommodation, with very lack, inadequate care and support. So got some, some quotes from hostel staff. Um, and uh, people working within the hospital. So this was a GP who goes into a hospital. So he's young, he's got HIV, he lives in a hostel, he hates it. He's got 28 beds and two staff. He's incontinent, lives in complete squalor, and the hostel is saying this is the best we can do. There is no more suitable place, there is no alternative. So the big question is where should he go? In the past, we've tried to put people into a hospice. One person in his 40s, we did get in there, and he was asked to leave because of his behaviour when drunk. And in the end, he died in the hospital, and he had cancer. So, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the hospice that couldn't maintain that person should have done. This is just, this is laying out the challenges there. And, uh, Challenges for hostels as a place of care is a real problem. So hostels are there to focus on recovery, as Caroline said. They have a model of recovery. They are meant to be temporary accommodation that support people um, until they can move into less supported accommodation. Um, so the staff are not trained to support clients with deteriorating health, and they, they don't have any health training. Um, they, they don't store or administer medication. They don't they don't do personal care, and they often really, really struggle to get social services support. Um, there's often very, very low staff to client ratios. So when we even talk about a high support need hospital, all that means is there's somebody there at night, a concierge to let people in. It doesn't mean there is support provided. Key working sessions are there to support people deal with their alcohol and drugs and get them into appointments and into training. It's not there to provide care and support for people who are sick. So there's not only difficulty getting uh, access to palliative care, but also social care, as I mentioned. And often the hospital environment is very chaotic, um, and people raised in our interviews that they felt it was just not the right environment for people. 
Um, and deaths also have a huge impact on staff and injuries. So this quote, I think, is lovely. We're working in recovery. Nowhere did they tell me I'd be dealing with death so often. I mean, we do it, but we need a lot of support. There's also often a lack of understanding from our healthcare providers, for example, hospital discharge teams, um, who think about what a hospital can offer. So this is another big, big area of our concern. But what if the hostel is seen as somebody's home? What if it's somewhere they want to spend the last weeks, months, days of their life? So it was his desire to remain here, and he wanted to remain here. And for me personally, I don't think we should go against and I, I've had it when people end up in hospital and you know that's the last place they want to be. So there are huge barriers here for the advanced care planning. So we talked about the uncertainty of prognosis, lack of options to actually offer people at the moment, um, but also a huge lack of confidence um, amongst staff and denial from all sides around the age and how can this person really be dying. And there's also a real concern about the fragility and about removing hope from people. Many people are using substances to blank out past traumas. We know that, that there's a huge proportion, as I mentioned before, of people who've had complex childhoods with multiple complex traumas. So, however, I am going to move on to how we overcome those challenges. So the rest of the talk, I hope, is going to be a little bit more upbeat and more positive about what are we doing here now? Why, why are we talking about this and what can we do to improve the situation? Because I believe there is a lot that everyone in this room can be doing. So firstly, one of our recommendations is let's shift the focus. Let's not think of Gemma and think about, oh my gosh, how do we start broaching the subject of uh, wishes and, uh, and, 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 and planning? We can't do really. So if you can't predict, how do you plan? So I think we need to shift the focus from thinking about end-of-life care or even palliative care and thinking about advanced ill health. Um, and so this is something that Neve is going to be talking about more. It's about so it's supporting staff to identify when somebody, when their health is a concern to them. So for hostel staff, for example, when they're concerned about someone, that's the time to get support. And conversations should be around exploring insights into illness, wishes and choices not just about giving warning that like, if you don't stop thinking, you'll die. And these conversations need to be early and repeated. But again, Neve will share some tools that, that have been developed on this. Um, and it's about living well. And it's also, I think, which is a real relief, hostel staff find is really a, a great relief when we say this. It's, you know, if somebody can't face life without alcohol, then by barraging them constantly because of your anxiety, that's not going to do them any about thinking about what will make that person live well, what is important to them, and accepting these decisions, which you may feel are very unwise decisions, but accepting them and working from where a person is. Starting here and now, <coughs> you're here, we can change, we can have repeated conversations, but we're not going to try and, and barrage you that you have to do something about something which you are unable to do. So the other big recommendation is getting more multidisciplinary support. So it's making sure we're sharing the load where applicable. I think we are a very effective team. This was a, this was a um, specialist nurse again. From, well, we're very fortunate in, in, in one of the boroughs in London where there, there's, there's quite a lot of specialist nurses go into the hospitals there. Um, I think we're a very effective team, and sometimes we as individuals might take on more than we need to. I think that palliative care, end of life care, is something which is so multidisciplinary. We are incredibly good at what we do, but we cannot solve all of the problems. End of life care on our own. So, really key. And then, how do we do that? Well, one of our, what, what, what we feel that everyone who is working in palliative care can be starting to think about in their organisation is how they can support um, within reach potentially into their local homes and um, places. So, um, in reach could help with identifying people whose health is a concern having these conversations, supporting the staff with that, supporting the development of care plans, um, optimising pain relief and other symptom control, obviously, so the, 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 and, and, but really facilitating access to social care and potentially continuing healthcare funding. I don't think I've, I've hardly ever come across somebody within a hostel who's, who's been on, who's got continuing healthcare funding, and yet 
I think there are many people who are entitled to them. So there's a lot I think that could really be gained from this joint working. Um, there's also obviously training of hospital staff and bereavement support for staff and other residents. So we have developed, so this was um, again another collaborative piece of work with um, with St Mungo's, so with me, Dorothy, and Peter Kennedy, uh, Lee's predecessor, and ourselves, um, a, a new website which is free to access, live, and you can use that um, as part of your, um, if you're training people and uh, out of interest as well. And this is a toolkit which, again, some of the tools will be shared by me in a few minutes. So, in an ideal world, there should be choices. There should be choices for people um, that they can choose to live in a home, not just temporary accommodation, with the support wrapped around them. Um, a hostel-based hospice, which again is something which needs to mention that that's model does work. But in the meantime, which would be a facility that understands people's needs and can provide 24-hour care and support for, for people with potentially complex needs, such as the people I've described. But, in the meantime, due to the lack of alternatives, we can't just wait. We need to start moving and doing more multidisciplinary support. Now, I know there are many people here who are already doing things, and we hope that we will be able to share and leave time for sharing a lot of your experiences as well with everyone in the group. Um, our next steps, I'm just going to very briefly mention. So, um, we, we are, um, so this is again funded by the Oak Foundation. This is again this collaborative piece of work should have mentioned these partners, but they will slide in a minute. But that's sort of um, St. Mungo's, Marie Curie Research Team, and Pathway. Um, and we are we've now been funded to look at the next stage, which is trying to actually work out a system where we can get hospices linked with, um, with hostels and day centres and really evaluate the impact and see what, what, what can make a difference. But you don't need to, people can do stuff without waiting for the results to see. So we're starting in two um, hubs and we're going to roll out to a further eight in the country, um, which we haven't decided on further eight yet. So if anyone's very, very keen, uh, it won't be until the middle of next year that we would be ready to start that. Uh, please do let us know. Um, and um, and that, that will be around training people to be local specific champions um, from the hospice and champions from the homeless. From, from the homeless hostel um, and working together to, uh, to pull in multidisciplinary support for people. So I'm going to end now with thanks to all of the partners and um, there's also a list of publications which you'll see. Um, the other thing I'll put up, if anyone's interested in homeless health generally, um, there's Homeless Link, which obviously Caroline mentioned, um, and there's also Pathway. Um, and there's a there's a faculty of homes and inclusion health and you can join that just by following a link and clicking on it and then you find out about lots of events and any uh, materials as well um, and our publications are, are available uh, most of them are open access I think they all are actually and they can also be all found with links to them from the pathway website um, as well so i shall now finish there and hand over thank you Member of different types of homelessness and what's that up for me? Obviously, there's one thing, but there's other types of homelessness as well. Consider that. I think about the backstory people who had those adverse childhood experiences that result in homelessness, mental health, child abuse, all the things that Caroline like mentioned that result in that situation. That's a person as a whole that you need to consider. And the bit of that work is number one, I thought, was important to look at the NRPF and the, the challenges of just charging for those who are not familiar. So, so the second speaker, Eve Brophy, who is palliative care coordinator for St Mungo's, from this charity. And Eve works with residents who are vulnerable in house and have accommodation, or who have advanced ill health. And she works to ensure they have best care, mixed medical, nursing, psychological, social, and spiritual needs as they can approach end of lives with dignity and respect. Hello, everybody. Um, 
so my name is Neve. I am the palliative care coordinator for St. Mungo's. Um, so we are a homeless charity primarily based in London and the south of England. So we provide 1,700 um, bed spaces to people who are homeless um, or vulnerably housed across um, that whole area. And we have other services as well, so to support people getting back into um, employment, um, to upskill them, to give them some skills and things as well, um, to live more independent lives. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about my role, um, so briefly just tell you about what I do. Um, it's a model of care that works um, in St Mungo's but is easily scalable and useful in, in different settings. Um, I'll go through a brief case study um, just to sort of illustrate how I work within hospice. And then we will also go through, um, I'll also go through just some examples of other work going on in the UK and further afield. And that hopefully will give us some um, food for thought in terms of the discussion we'll have afterwards. Um, okay. Um, so my role has three main um, aspects to it. Um, the first is around case management. Um, so I will support directly case manage um, clients who have a terminal illness or in the absence of an actual diagnosis, just support clients who have advanced deteriorating health, as Caroline mentioned. Um, a lot of my role is also around education and training for hostel staff. So these hostel staff that um, are supporting our clients are working in recovery. Um, so they have come in, they've taken these jobs, expecting to support people with their addictions to move back into independent living and live fulfilling lives. Um, so it's a total shift in their mindset to actually be providing end-of-life care, which is happening more and more often, sadly. Um, so a lot of my role is around supporting staff to increase their knowledge, increase their confidence in actually being in that environment and providing that sort of support to clients. Um, and to support that, we also have a befriending volunteer service. Um, so they are uh, volunteers who are trained up, have um, knowledge of bereavement, um, they've been, they're going to be trained by crews um, and also trained in um, sort of foundations of palliative care so they can um, provide that sort of uh, emotional support to clients and also to staff. So the, that's a quick way of missing. Um, so I try to coordinate a flexible and responsive um, care pathway for clients and it has to be flexible, it has to be res uh, responsive. A lot of our clients are not on a traditional disease trajectory where they just slowly get more and more well. A lot of them have very um, uh, acute deteriorations and their illnesses are characterized by um, deterioration over many, many years from the, you know, for six, the last six months of life. So we need to be flexible and responsive to the changing needs of that client group. Um, advocacy is so important. So many of our clients fall through the cracks. Um, so many of them don't have family or friends asking after them, going to appointments with them, and um, supporting them to understand what's happening. Um, so there's a, a very important role in that, um, that that I play, but also all our staff play as well. Um, training, training, as I mentioned, and the, it's very important to build trusting relationships. The trust can be um, easily lost and very hard to win with this client group, and you can't. I think, well, for any of us, it would be very difficult to come in and have end-of-life discussions with somebody that, that you don't know, that you're not familiar with. So what we try to do is build trusting, trusting relationships through the volunteers or use the people who they already have trust in, like the staff, and support them to have those conversations as well. Um, so just a note on the training. So we've been delivering, I deliver training to our hostel staff or an outreach teams. Um, and we've developed this, um, it's been informed by Caroline's research. Um, so we have six, diff no, seven different modules. Um, so they could be um, a big, hefty two-day training, or um, what we prefer to do is uh, break them down into, say, an hour, hour and a half modules based on the needs of the team. Um, and I find uh, it's actually easier, I think. I usually approach... Um, clients and deliver training depending on what's happening with them at the time. So I think palliative care for people working in recovery, it's, it's dense, it's quite a lot to take on. Um, and I find that it's actually, I get 
much better response and uptake and, and the knowledge sort of stay, stays inside when you approach people at the time that they need it. So if you have a client who um, has just been discharged with a, a, a diagnosis or if they're really worried somebody's going downhill, we'll probably do a session around identifying clients. So what sort of things should we be looking at um, for people who have advanced um, ill health? Or if somebody has been given a poor prognosis and they're thinking, okay, we need to find out what, what his wishes are or speak to them about that. We'll probably do a training on engaging clients and communication. And so we do it again as quite responsive, but also proactive as well in terms of what they need at that time. Um, and just a note on the volunteer service as well. So we've got, I've got a new member of staff starting in January and her role will be to expand the volunteer service. Um, so with, with the aim to provide companionship, not just for clients who are at end of life. I think I find, um, had this conversation recently with um, a, a Jew from St. Anne's, we were talking about you know, having volunteers come, turn up to one of our hostels and you, to, to meet with somebody saying who's very, who's very well, and often they'll be met with um, a not very polite invite to leave um, from the client, for whatever reason, it's not the day to talk to them. Um, and so we found that you don't want volunteers to be sort of leaving and feel like they, you know, what, what is their role there. So we've expanded the role to include support for staff. So say in that instance, in that example, okay, the client isn't ready, doesn't want to speak to them. What about the staff? So they go and provide emotional support to staff, but also information, signposting, just explore um, the situation and what's going on for the staff member as well. Um, and that we expect that take up will be really, really popular. Um, and another, yes, yeah, so another aspect again, where I, I'm just uh, one role across all of St. Mungo's, um, so I don't have capacity usually to spend time to build up a relationship with our clients. And this is where the service will become more sustainable because our volunteers will have the time to do that. And hope, we're hoping that from that we will be able to facilitate family reconnection. Um, that's often a very big um, and important issue for people coming to the end of their lives who, um, for many reasons, may have lost touch with their family um, or they feel very ashamed of their situation and would want to see their family again but don't know how to reconnect. Um, so that's a big role that the volunteers will play as well. So I'll just do um, just go through a case study at the moment of um, sadly quite a typical um, case that we come across. So David um, was only 34, um, was diagnosed with end-stage liver disease. So he's fancy in a night of hospital, um, is very, very unwell. His health has been deteriorating for many years. Um, he pro is very prone to isolate himself. Again, that's not uncommon. Um, so there's uh, Bonner and Luskell, I think, did a piece of research that found that over half um, people who are experiencing homelessness and spend most of their time alone. Um, one in three consider themselves to have no close friends. And that I find that really shocking because I think you know, all of us, I hope, would be able to feel like they have at least one person that they could speak to or count on or be supported by if their health is deteriorating. Um, this is similar in David's case, not he doesn't have anybody. He, he's very isolated and, and lives in our hostel um, with limited input from friends or other residents. Um, he has no intention of going to detox, no intention of going to rehab. When you speak about it, um, he doesn't want to be around alcoholics. He himself is not an alcoholic, so why would he want, it would just make him feel bad to be um, around people like that. Um, so that's his frame of mind at the moment, and that brings up a lot of challenges for staff because this gentleman is at end of life because of his, his drinking, and yet he's not in a place to be talking about his end of life due to his drinking. Um, his mum pops in and out now and again, and they have a very, very difficult um, history. So that's another aspect of the care that, that the staff are actually having to deal with. Um, again, he because he's coming back out of hospital, he's treated in hospital, he sort of improves, discharges, and um, then deteriorates as soon as he starts drinking again. So the hospital staff are understandably very anxious, they can see what's happening. It's happened before with other clients. Um, it's not a case of if, it's a case of 
well. Um, so the way that we approach this, um, this is a standard um, organ failure trajectory graph. Um, so it's characterized by acute deteriorations um, and then recovery almost to the point where you were before. Um, so those acute deteriorations for David are usually him going into hospital very, very unwell. Um, and we use this in our training to support staff to help them see it as opportunities to engage in advanced care planning. So all of those acute deteriorations, when David comes out of hospital, we found very often that's a good opportunity to actually open up a conversation about what's happening, what's going on for David. Um, he hates being in hospital, so he'll have a lot to say. Um, so he'll be open to it, he'll be engaged with us quite well. Um, but we use those hospital um, admissions as opportunities to engage. Um, we don't always talk about end of life. Um, that's not the way we approach it. We have, as Caroline spoke, spoke about, early and repeated conversations. And we're not just looking to talk about um, end of life, we're talking about living well. So what actually is important to him, now that he's come back from hospital, you know, what would improve his quality of life for today, you know, for next week or the week after. And it's person-centered. So. Although we would all hope that what he says when we ask him what he wants is to go to detox and rehab, um, that's not what he wants, that's not his wish, that's not his intention. Um, and it's very difficult for a staff to be around that, to, to, to respect that and to honour those wishes, but they are what his wishes are. Um, so we've also implemented a what we call a high-risk client review meeting. Um, so this works very well for people like David who don't have a, a certain um, prognosis. We don't know how, how long um, he will remain ill for. Um, so we have the GP, um, a lovely nurse from the hospice who comes, um, our hostel manager, myself, and a drug and alcohol representative. And we get together. Um, our primary aims are to share information about clients that we're concerned about. Um, to coordinate care. I just can't believe the amount of times that people are just fall, fall through the cracks. And again, because mental health won't take them because they have a substance use issue and substance use won't take them because they've got a mental health issue, then they're really end up, they've just got no support. Um, so this meeting is, is designed to sort of ensure that people don't fall through the cracks. Um, it works very well for people like David. Um, and the outcome, we speak about David, but all of the clients that we're worried about in the hostel. Um, so again, it's quite empowering for staff because they have an opportunity to use their intuition. You know, it may often clients don't have a, a, a known diagnosis, but they will just see that something is wrong. They're the ones on the front line. They're the ones most likely to, to detect changes in people. Um, and so they, they're invited to um, present cases at, at this meeting as well. So the outcome for David um, is, is ongoing, and we're fostering this collaborative MDT approach. And again, it's flexible and it's responsive. So um, when David deteriorates, we'll probably have a meeting every two weeks or so. We have an ongoing email um, link with the GP and with the nurse to get advice about what we need to do next. Um, we're identifying small goals with him. Um, so the most recent one was saving up to buy cinema tickets for him and his girlfriend to go to the cinema. That was, I haven't seen someone more proud. <laughs> it was really wonderful to see. Um, and he's also looking at writing a letter to his sister who he's lost touch with. So these are small little goals, but they have such an impact on somebody's life, on, on their feeling of self-worth. Um, and at the same time as having these conversations about what's important, and we're also talking about <coughs> documenting wishes. Um, if, there, if he does go back into hospice, so what are the sorts of things he'd like to happen? Um, perhaps we can avoid hospital and have input from the palliative care team. Um, our nurse from St. Joseph's Hospice in Hackney um, has delivered some training for us as well, um, and other hospices has offered, offered it as well, so it's a good um, partnership work that we, that we have going on, um, and that's really helped staff, again, to increase their knowledge and confidence because they have the support of specialists and um, they feel like they can do it, which is wonderful. We review these meetings regularly and David is in control of his journey, which is the most positive outcome that um, we would we feel hope for. 
the impact on staff is also very important um, and it's been very positive. Um, so staff report that they feel better prepared um, practically. There's so many practical issues to think about and provide an end of life care in a hostel setting, um, but they feel more um, confident, they feel, feel more knowledgeable about the sorts of things they need to be thinking about. Um, and I love that so they've said before, they've had other clients where, similar to David, who have just died in the hostel with no support and no employment, it's been very traumatic for them. Um, but staff with this input from the MDT, with this extra training, with these regular emails from the GP, they say, you know, although we don't want this to happen to anybody, if it does, we feel like we can do it. And I think that is, you know, coming coming from hostels, if you've ever been in a hostel, it's wonderful to hear hostel staff say that, you know, that they feel that they can do this, that they're getting the right support, so they feel empowered. The reality is, of course, that David is drinking and he will continue to drink until he dies. That is his wish, and for him, that's a good death. Um, and I think that raises a lot for us as professionals, I think. Um, it can be quite a difficult pill to swallow for hostel staff, certainly, if it's somebody's drinking themselves to death. Um, but there's this idea, I think, of this raises the idea of equality and equity. Equality being the same care for everybody, equity being the right thing for the right person. And I think for me it just raises these questions of, you know, can we quantify a good death that's applicable for everybody across the board? How do we define dignity? And is dignity the same for everybody? I know for myself, a good death would not be drinking myself to death in a hostel, but for David and for many others, it is. And where do we stand with that in being able to facilitate that as professionals? I think this quote sums it up quite well um, from Caroline's research. Um, so people just need to be themselves. That's quite comforting at the end of life, I think, that everything is normal. Like S, bargain hunt on the telly, K in one hand, cigarette in the other, he was happy. And people shouting, not a problem, because it's like I can be, I, I feel like I can be myself right up to my last breath in this situation. So that is how I work. Um, I'm a palliative care coordinator role in St. Mungo's work, but there are many other models of care that work around the world. So they focus on education for hostel and healthcare, hostel staff. Um, there are homeless champions, palliative care champions, um, hospices and respite facilities. So there's lots of different models out there and I'll go through just a few now. Um, so St. Luke's in Cheshire, they have a homeless nurse, um, Alison and two counsellors that do in reach support to hospital. Um, so they have support around symptom management and they also provide training, um, tra training provided for medical staff so that the hospice is seen as an option for this group. They do training for hostel staff as well. Um, St. Luke's in Plymouth have a different model around end-of-life ambassadors. Um, so they are 12 organisations that all provide support to homeless people and they have 55 ambassadors within that. Um, and they provide, they're trained up to facilitate support and access to end-of-life services for homeless people. So again, people who are empowered with knowledge and in settings where they come across people who are homeless. With deteriorating health. There's a BRICS model in Bradford, um, so they have uh, respite beds, hospital beds, um, designed for homeless patients coming out of hospital, um, and they're an alternative to people staying in the hospital for a long time. Um, I think they've had end of, yes, end, end of life cases in, in this setting as well. And we alluded to uh, the Hospice for Homeless People, so that's in Canada, um, the Ottawa Mission. Um, they have, it's nurse-led care and they have supervision from physicians. They, it's linked in with the hostel, so when people are unwell, they move from the hostel into the hospice beds. Um, end of life care can be delivered there, or if people improve, they can move back into the hostel. So it's a familiar environment, it's seen as quite, it's normalised as well because it's part of one building. Um, 
and they've demonstrated um, the effectiveness, cost effective, it improves quality, quality of life and quantity. So in summary, um, early palliative care improves quality and quantity of life for people who have quite poor quality and limited quantity of life. I think they're surely deserving of this care, of this early intervention. So just some things that we could do, not we, you could do, um, on individual and hospital levels, so help us um, identifying people whose health is a concern. Um, as Caroline mentioned, supporting us with development of care plans, pain management plans are particularly important, especially if people are self-medicating or are opioid dependent. It can be very difficult to, um, to develop care plans when care is crisis-led. Um, and also escalation plans as well, so if people are not engaging and remaining in a hospital, we, we, it's, it can create a lot of anxiety not knowing what we should do and at what point. Support with training, of course, um, and increasing access to social services care, as, as Caroline mentioned. On a service level, um, you could initiate partnerships um, with the homelessness sector, so your local hostels, perhaps. You know, where are they? What sort of needs do they have? Um, could you help in any way? Um, actually develop a homelessness strategy for your organisation. And develop things like homelessness champions. So all of these things, what I've, what we've spoken about today, are scalable. You can pick even just one aspect and integrate it into a role, um, or use it as a model of care to um, pilot and, and get funding for the longer term. And so they're just some ideas. And I think now we will, um, we have some questions. Yes, so I'll hand over to Caroline. Thank you. I think there's some really powerful solutions there. And for me, I remember the film moving in Las Vegas and Nicholas Cage. Remember that film where he's driven himself to death and a bit about people's wishes are their wishes and you have to respect those wishes, whatever they may be. But whatever you may think as an individual or your own standards, recognize that person has their wishes and you need to respect those. So thank you so much for, for those wonderful solutions. So um, we've got some. Uh, Questions here. Are there any questions for me or Caroline before we go into these discussions? Any questions? Are there mics somewhere in the room? Thank you, Shanae. So, Mike will come to you. You could um, pose your question. Yeah. Lady here. Hi, question for me. Um, there's <coughs> training of those seven modules. Is that accessible for people to, to come and book in, or do you go out across the country? Um, the <laughs> I have to be. Uh, careful here. Um, the training, the toolkit that we mentioned, the homelesspalliativecare.com, um, that basically is all of our knowledge of the training up on there, and it's divided into those same sections. So it's designed to, you're very welcome to look at it and develop your own training. At the moment, um, simply due to capacity, I can only um, deliver training in house, let's say, among those, but it could be something. Um, so that we'd encourage everybody to develop within their own services. I'd be happy to help as well. Any questions? Anyone? I can't remember which you mentioned it, but this question of reconnecting back to families and the problem of shame. Do you work with the families on the other side of that um, mm -hmm. at all, or is that just too difficult? Um, Yes, I think yes. That's I think because of every case is so individual, we you have to you can't just be working with the, the client because a lot of the time maybe the family don't want to be. Or there's a lot of hurt. There's, you know, they're estranged for a reason, um, and so it is important to um, we have different ways of sort of reaching out of, of reconnecting. It's very sensitive and going to be led by the individual nature of the case, but we would support. I'm still in contact with some families patients who died um, recently over the last couple of months so just supporting them with what's happened um, absolutely so they, it needs to be um, holistic yeah and if I can just add I think um, some people don't have any idea where their families are Salvation Army have a service to help people any questions yeah, yeah. Hey, um, from a hospital in, in Scotland can I ask about the homelessness Reduction Act, is that just in England? Yes, just in, yes, that's just in England, yes. 
I wouldn't have seen Scotland. Okay. But actually, Scotland got rid of priority state. I think Scotland are ahead of the game anyway. Are, yeah. um, so England, Scotland, Wales all have slightly different legislation. So Scotland were the first to remove priority need for one of the five tests to enable somebody to get support for, for their homelessness. So in fact, Scotland should be better than England. They usually are ahead of the game. <laughs> Any, any more questions? We're going to take a Okay, so we've got um, three questions here, just for discussion. We <laughs> could have some uh, uh, parts to have a discussion about some of the things that you're doing in your area. So the quick question we're looking at is what services have you found useful um, that's working at the moment? Which models are working well in your area? And what might help you in your area to improve housing care for people experiencing homelessness? So just a kind of open discussion. People are kind of throwing their ideas in terms of just like the services. Are any services found useful in, in the services you're working with at the moment? Anyone want to throw any ideas out like, yeah? here? Yeah. Don't they be here? Interesting. Might well come to you. Thanks. Um, is that right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm Alison from St. Luke's Hospice in Cheshire. Um, and I'm a nurse by background, but I've happened to be a volunteer at Home Stopping for the last eight years uh, on the day off. Anyway, we're, we're running a project at the moment for people who are um, homeless and at end of life. And basically, it's it's on a tiny scale compared to, you know, me, 1,700 beds a year. We haven't got that. We don't need that. Um, but, but what we've done is, is downscale that great deal, really. So... We do loads of education and training within hostels for staff who need it. Um, and some of it can be really simple, like, you know, how do you reposition somebody? Because actually they're not personal carers, and what can you do to help? Who do you contact when you need help? Do you want our 24-hour hotline number? Um, do I need to link you in with another hospice within that area? So I'm covering three areas. We also do training for student nurses. So... Um, by the end of this week, we will have seen something like 135 student nurses um, and just taught them a little bit about homeless health and end of life care in the hope that when they qualify, then they know exactly what to do. And I'll bring in the Homeless Reduction Act and the need to refer, etc. Um, also, see social workers, and that's really difficult because trying to get an adult social care assessment is not easy. But actually, again, it's about perception, so getting social workers to see the difficulties for hostel staff, for hospital staff, for hospice staff, and how it helps if you all work together. So we do, we do a bit of that. Um, and then some case management as well. So we've got some at the moment who's really chaotic. The hostel are really struggling. Well, it's a shared house. And I, I probably touch base with this key worker five times a week, literally, just to keep them um, going. Um, and also, we link in with a local hepatology nurse, it's fantastic. And she'll just ring me and, and, and say, this has happened, or I can ring her and say, okay, he's now nine kilograms up, does he need to go into hospital? So we found a better pathway in, so it doesn't sit through A and E for the, the 10 hours waiting to go in. And in terms of what services have we found useful, um, just discovered a fantastic Macmillan nurse, and I have to say, not every Macmillan nurse is open to this sort of thing. I've had bitter experience in that way, but I've just found one who's really good, and it looks like it's just going to get us continued health care funding for this person, which we've never had before, but actually he's done it really cleverly. He's asked for mental health services to provide two visits a day to this person to help with meds, because that's his issue. It's about what he needs. It's not what about it's not about four visits a day for the sake of nothing. Uh, so the cert What's helped in our area is, is really getting together and using the services that, that are around us. And that's it, really. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts as to what's working well in your area and what might help you before we finish? Or indeed, I think yeah. what's what's not working well. Do you yeah. have any challenges? Because it's quite quickly dis discussed as well. Yeah. Maybe it depends on you. Hand up so that you can find you. Um, thank you. I'm 
providing support for the homeless in the food shop, and the homeless support for the homeless in the food shop. And it's really inspiring hearing the stories of what people are to do. Um, I don't know if any of you have been listening to any of the Project Echo um, lectures, you know, that's been held during the conference. But that's potentially a really good medium to, you know, enable education to be accessed to hostile workers, maybe regionally, and palliative care, bringing other healthcare professionals together to create that community of practice. And I just sort of wanted to make that as a comment, but that's a very useful way of enabling you know, our limited resources to be able to reach out to these very vulnerable populations and the, and the you know, support workers who are looking after these people to help you know, advise them in the best way to, you know, to do that research. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. How, how do we, um, will I get in touch with you about the project that I was talking to your colleague David about? It? Yeah, it's actually through, through Hospice UK. Actually. Great. So, okay. um, and if you're on the website, there will be information on that. Right. But it's, it's, you know, follow up on the research. Great, thank you. And you, just to say as well, so we are looking at uh, echo technology to be able to support in working around homes and echo. That's something which we should be looking at. Scotland again, thank you. Hi, Megan um, from St. Carlos in Edinburgh. Um, I am at a CNS, but I'm actually an uh, echo lead for um, St. Carlos in, in Edinburgh. So within Edinburgh, there's a Mad Peak Hospice as well, so we're working together with the CNS is in a Mad and the PE team are working with the um, the access to practice, homeless, homeless to practice, and um, the technology just kind of having a register that helps to identify um, people. And the plan is for, for, this, for myself and, and that team to develop a homeless hostel staff network. Um, so we're just beginning with a background, um, you know, background work for that. Um, mm -hmm. Echo has been used for the care homes. And I understand care homes are then aligned with the hospices, but hostels are a lot of learning um, on the hostel staff. Um, but I would love to speak to about, about that as well, about how ECHO can um, be involved in this. Using, your, using the, um, the website, the information is, is going to be invaluable. And I've shown it to some um, practice staff, GPs, and um, CPMs, and they were you know, taking it. We've got two ladies just here and a lady from. Hi, I'm an outreach nurse and I'm a in hospice in London, Asia. I'm just being aware of what the reanimal not happening to us because it's not the world is going to And recently, I'm actually just trying to get going to us and look at the other things in prison. Is there a hospice that is in the kind of virus? Um, I think one of the things is I think Homeless Link have I, mean, I don't know if you want to talk about the Homeless Link I mean Homeless Link have a great way of finding out what is in each area um, so on homeless.org.uk um, and there you can type in your borough where you work and you'll see what hospitals are there what day centres are there and so that's a, that's a good start to find out what, what's available um, uh, but and in terms of if there are any where where is it your base is it um, Middlesbrough yeah so um, yeah so I don't know if there's no hospital teams or anything there mm -hmm. I don't know but, but, but I, I, I don't know if anyone's got anything else to add to that um, I think we generally say starting off you know doing this as Carla mentioned you know using the homeless link database and just doing a service mapping of what's in your area so they can vary from hostels day centers information services um, lots of different services for homeless people and i would then we then just recommend reaching out and then finding out from them what's going on what the need is and how and how, how you can help
Yeah. In terms of support with local authorities, if you've got somebody coming out of prison, um, the only thing I would say is um, that having somebody supporting someone to present themselves to local authorities is really, really helpful. Um, so that's again what our teams do within the hospital. We have housing work attached to, and we and I put all the medical information together, and we put everything together as to why this person really cannot be on the street. And I think so advocacy there, but this is for anybody who um, who is in need. Um, if they present themselves to local authorities, even with the Home Assist Reduction Act, it, it should be better, but it still can be very challenging for people not to be battered away just with a list of landlords or with a, a housing plan, which is not something that they, they are able to, 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 to be able to do. So I think, so if you do come across any, an individual that you feel needs support, if you can accompany them or get somebody else to support them and make sure you get all the evidence, uh, medical evidence and, 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 and outline what their needs really are, then that, that can also be really helpful. Well, let's face it, that what I mentioned is homeless England, because it's just for England and we're not updating it. So all the services in England should be drawn there by the end of the year in terms of where you can find accommodation, those entities, and so forth. My next question is Bailey from Edgar Hospice. Um, I'm a community development manager, not long in post, but I actually used to work for the YMCA, so I'm kind of really <coughs> interested in this topic. And maybe just something to share um, for others in the room that aren't, that are just starting this journey. What we've found is we've heard about a, a lot of training of hostel staff, but actually hospice staff need training in the issues of homelessness. And I would really encourage each hospice to get to know their local facilities, their local services, their local homeless reduction team at the council, the night shelter, especially now coming up, those that are happening over the winter and then those for the whole year, and to start building those relationships. And as we are not surprised, those partners often are reluctant to engage with the hospice as well because of um, misunderstanding what we can offer. So I think there's really a lot of work in building those trusts between the partners, let alone with the clients themselves. Um, so keep pushing at it, don't give up, I think it's encouragement. Thank you so much, and it's a great point to finish on. We have got some um, front of the room through cards to kind of Get you to pledge what you want to do, what you will do for improving end of life care for those period of time. So pick up and get one of them at the end of the uh, session and write in your pledges and uh, live with us, Melanie. Do you want to live with us? Yeah, okay. And uh, look forward to having your comments on those. Yes, yes one more. Can I just have one last comment? Sorry. Um, I know you're all about to go and have coffee. Um, it's just, I mentioned the um, our rolling out of integrating um, homelessness and palliative care uh, hubs here. Um, so we are starting with a hub in Kent and in London, um, but we are planning to roll out. So if you feel that you've got a, a, a significant homeless population, but you don't think it's something you are going to be able to sort out without additional support, do email me because I am over the next year or so, but it's not going to be urgent and I don't want to stop anyone doing what they can do here and now. So that's sort of my, my plea is carry on and do, but if you would also like to be possibly part of the next phase of this rollout work, um, if you could email me, that would be great. But put on the heading, on the subject heading, um, you know, the Hospice UK potential collaboration or something so that I don't see it. With all my other million emails. Caroline.shulman at caroline.shulman1 at nhs.net. But it is on the beginning of the presentation as well. But uh, so, yeah, thanks very much for that. Thank you. And thank you for your attention for being here today and discussing this issue with us. And thanks to our speakers.